Hi everybody and welcome to lecture three of the digital VLSI design course at bar -Ilan University. Today we'll start talking about logic synthesis. This is part one of a two-part lecture. In this lecture we'll focus mainly on standard cell libraries but um, we'll also discuss logic synthesis as a whole. In part two we'll go into the nitty-gritty nuts and bolts of logic synthesis. So let's start with an introduction. What is logic synthesis? So synthesis is the process that converts RTL into a technology-specific gate-level netlist optimized for a set of predefined constraints. What that means is you start with a behavioral RTL design, a standard cell library, and a set of design constraints. If we look at this graphically, we have a standard cell library, which we'll discuss in depth today, and a set of design constraints, which we'll discuss in lecture 5. Then we have our RTL description over here, which just describes a simple counter. We take that, we put it into our synthesis tool, and it spits out a netlist, a gate level netlist mapped to the standard cell library. So as you see here, we have all these standard cells, and they're instantiated with all the connectivity between them. So this is a gate level netlist. It's a list of nets and how they connect to the different gates inside. Um, it works for, uh, for not only for ASICs, but also for FPGAs. There we'll map it to lookup tables and uh, different pieces that are already synthesized inside the FPGA. Um, hopefully, the, what we get is uh, efficient in terms of speed, area, power, etc. So mathematically, we're given a finite state machine, f of x, y, z, lambda, and delta where X is the input alphabet, Y is the output alphabet, Z is a set of internal states, and lambda is a next state function from X to Z, X, Z to Z, and delta is a output function from X, Z to Y. Okay, and what the synthesis does is it takes this um, finite state machine that we had here, the inputs, um, the, the, the function, the outputs, and the current state, which is also input, and it turns it into a target circuit C of G and W, where G is a set of circuit components, that's uh, Boolean gates, flip-flops, etc., everything we see here, and W is a set of wires that are connecting uh, G together. So why do we want to perform logic synthesis? So uh, it's pretty clear, I guess, but um, it wasn't always, and in fact it ran into all kinds of, uh, um, ob uh, of objection at uh, first when they first introduced it. But what logic synthesis will do, it will automatically manage many details of the design processes, um, causing many fewer bugs. It will obviously improve productivity instead of drawing our gates and our logic by hand. And it abstracts the design data, the HDL description, from any particular implementation technology. And therefore, we can take our designs and move them from one technology to the other very easily. Um, in, some, in some cases, we can get a much more optimal design than you could get by hand, um, basically because the complexity is so hard, it's really hard to do it uh, by hand. The reason not to do logic synthesis, well, there aren't very many nowadays, but uh, in some cases, we may have uh, a priori knowledge of the design and we can do better things by ourselves. So just a simple example here, we have a module called foo with a bunch of inputs and this always block, it's a combinatorial always block with uh, these inputs. And all it's going to do, it's going to have some sort of if statement, which is some sort of a mux, we guess, that uh, in one case it'll output an A, in another case a B, but we have this very strange type of a statement here that we have to draw and maybe make some sort of a Carnot map or something to see what it actually is. Well, the synthesizer can deal with such a simple, trivial uh, problem very easily and figure out that all this is actually is an OR gate. So um, that's something that was pretty hard for us to do in our head. Um, it wasn't that hard probably if we drew the circuit and tried to see what that logic does, but when once we start getting many more input variables and uh, a lot more complex function, uh, it's going to be really hard, almost impossible to do by hand. So what are our goals when we do logic synthesis? So the first goal is to minimize the area. Um, area is in terms of literal count. We'll discuss that in part two of this lecture. Um, uh, there's also cell count, register count, all, all kinds of other metrics that we try to minimize. 
we are obviously trying to maximize performance. So we're going to try to get the maximum clock frequency or at least make the clock frequency that was determined to us through, through the constraints that we'll learn about. Um, we're going to try to minimize power. We're going to try to minimize the switching activity in, indiv in individual gates, de uh, deactivated circuit blocks, etc. And of course, as in most optimization problems, we're going to try to find um, the best combination of the above. Um, we're going to give different weights to each problem. Um, maybe one design wants a smaller area, another design wants higher performance, etc. And so we formulate some sort of a constraint problem saying something like minimize the area of a clock speed that is at least 300 megahertz. For more global objectives, um, we can get some feedback from layout. We get actual physical sizes, delays, placement and routing and try to put that into our optimization problem. So how does uh, this work? Well, just as a very high level uh, description of this, we have a variety of general and ad hoc methods. For example, instantiation. So we have these primitives like AND gates, OR gates, XOR gates, or functions, rather that we can instanti instantiate. So if we run into an OR um, operator in the Verilog, what we can do is just take one of these OR uh, um, primitives that we have in, inside our synthesis tool and replace it with that. We can do what we call macro expansion or substitution. So if we run into a more complex type of a behavioral uh, uh, description, such as a plus, okay, when we want to do addition of uh, two 32-bit words or something, that's not just a full adder or something like that. We have all kinds of, you know, carry look-ahead adders or ripple carry adders, and um, our tool can replace them with one of those architectures. Or if we have constructs such as an if-else or a case or something, we can expand it into such special circuits. Um, we have all kinds of functions that can tell our tool what these different operators inside the Verilog should be substituted with. Inference. So inference is when we run into a special pattern that's in the in the language description and we can do something with it. Um, inference often or most often uh, uh, refers to inferring uh, sequential elements. So if we run into an always at pause edge clock block, um, the tool will look for flip flops that um, that actually describe what's happening inside. And uh, we have all kinds of different types of flip-flop primitives inside our design, such as a synchronous, asynchronous reset, uh, enable flip-flops, etc. Logic optimization, this is something that um, the synthesizer will do after reading in the design and turning it into some sort of internal database, and it will start uh, trying to group together the Boolean operations and optimize uh, with logic minimization techniques. And finally, we have structural reorganization, which means that we don't only have to take the, um, the Boolean logic as is, we can also play all kinds of games like retiming of circuits, which we'll discuss in, a, in, a, in the next lecture. So um, let's look at a basic uh, synthesis flow. This is very high level. Um, you will understand the different parts of this as we go on with this lecture and the next. So um, we're going to start with syntax analysis. Okay, we're going to read in the hardware description language files and check for syntax errors um, in cadence genus that will be done with uh, the read hdl command um, so we're going to read our verilog file basically the next stage which we're going to discuss uh, predominantly in this lecture is the library definition stage the library definition stage is telling um, the synthesis tool what our technology is um, what our leaf cells are, in other words, what types of IPs we have inside that we're going to use and so forth. So we do that with a, a, a type of a, of a command such as read libs, which reads a file with a .lib extension, which we'll describe later as liberty file. Um, but in general, it's telling the synthesis tool what our technology is, what our hard macros are, what our standard cells and IPs, etc. are. Elaboration and binding is the next stage, and this is the actual first step of synthesis, um, which is when we convert the RTL into a Boolean structure, and then we start running all kinds of optimizations uh, according to computational Boolean algebra, all kinds of state reduction, encoding, re register inferring, and um, when we reach all kinds of leaf cells that we don't know what to do with, such as a, an IP like an SRAM block or an IO cell or some sort of an analog block, um, and also when we run into things like uh, instantiated standard cells, what we have to do is bind them, which is
which means basically point to one of these actual IPs and say, okay, we stop here and we don't continue trying to uh, optimize those. So um, the type of, uh, of command inside Genus is to elaborate and you can also describe what your top level uh, module is. Okay, uh, the next stage, after we've done the elaboration, we basically have some sort of a structural model of what our, uh, what our design is inside um, the database of the tool. So now we can know where the, what the top level ports are and we have different, we can go and uh, traverse the logic and so forth, which means that we can actually define our constraints, how fast we want to go and all kinds of other things like that. Um, we have a, a lot to discuss about constraints. I uh, am only gonna, I'm gonna defer that to lecture five, so I'm not gonna go into constraints right now. But uh, in general, we usually use a format called SDC, Synopsis Design Constraints, even though there are other ways of defining constraints. And so we use a command such as read SDC and point to the SDC file to uh, define those. Next, we go into what we call pre-mapping optimization. So basically, we take our, our Boolean logic that we've elaborated with, with our uh, binding, and we map to these generic cells that are internal to the, to the um, tool, which represent kind of standard cells that it would generally find in a library, and do all kinds of heuristics and optimizations on that. Next, we go to a very important stage called technology mapping, which this is where the tool actually connects just this RTL behavioral description that is, uh, is independent of the technology. It maps it to the actual standard cells um, with real delays and real, um, and real uh, limitations or, or features of the standard cell library. Post mapping, mapping optimization is iterating over the design, doing all kinds of things, running all kinds of heuristics and optimizations, trying to change um, what we're doing. So in, uh, in Cadence Genus, we have three stages, syn generic, syn map, and syn opt that do these three stages of, of uh, logic synthesis. Finally, once we've finished, we have to see what our results are like. So first we'll start with a lot of reports. We'll, um, we want to look at the timing, for instance, of the design. We want to look at the size, uh, the size estimation, uh, what kind of gates we're using and so forth. So we use a uh, all kinds of report commands. And once we finished and we're happy with what we got, we're gonna need to move on to our, uh, our physical implementation, our place and route tool. And for that, we have to export the results of what we got. Uh, for example, here, the write HDL command will export the net list, the gate level net list in structural Verilog. So following the introduction, we'll start discussing the actual synthesis flow. And as you see here on the right side of our screen, we have this flow chart of uh, the, the different steps in synthesis that we presented before. We'll start going through them and we'll have this little chart um, escorting us throughout these two lectures, uh, pointing out which step we're on, just to remember where we are. So we'll start with compilation or syntax analysis. This is a kind of a short uh, little step here, but I just want to mention the, this fact about compilation and the synthesis flow. So before we start to synthesize, we need to check the syntax for correctness, and that is what we call compilation. Um, however, we're talking about a synthesizer, not a compiler. Generally, when we talk about a compiler in a regular uh, programming language, in a sequential programming language, what we do is we recognize all the possible constructs in a formally defined program language. We translate them to a machine language represent, uh, representation of execution process. So we have all kinds of instructions that our processor can uh, carry out. And what we do is we take our higher level uh, language, we um, turn it into uh, assem uh, assembly code, and then we use an assembler to turn it into a machine language. That's basically what a compiler does. That's very different than what a synthesizer does. A synthesizer, it recognizes a target-dependent subset of a hardware description language, so it can only recognize RTL constructs if we use all kinds of initial blocks and so forth. They're unsynthesizable. Then it maps them to a collection of concrete hardware resources. These are our standard cells. We actually turn what we wrote in our hardware description language to actual hardware, and this is an iterative tool in the design flow. So whereas a compiler took our sequential language and turned it into sequential instructions that are fed into the um, into the processor. What synthesis does, it takes our same type of uh, 
language, but instead of turning it into sequential instructions, it turns it into actual hardware blocks. Um, I just want to point out that we can use our uh, incisive tool to compile. It's actually a part of the incisive tool uh, that's uh, called ncverilog. And to just compile and not run a simulation, we can write ncverilog and then the, the file name. This will help us easily run compilation and point us to syntax errors that we can get rid of. Um, alternatively, we can use the irun minus compile, and that will also help us do that. So that was just a real short uh, part of syntax analysis because that's not the main focus of, uh, of this lecture or this course. What we're going to start doing is from the second stage, which is library definition. And actually, library definition will take us from now until the end of this first part of the, of the synthesis lecture because it's something we have to elaborate on very, uh, very deeply before we go on. So it's all about the standard cells. The library definition stage um, tells the synthesizers where to look for leaf cells for binding and the target library for technology mapping. So basically, if we have all kinds of um, instantiations of uh, types of cells that do not appear, that we don't have a, an RTL description for them, there's no module statement uh, telling about a cell, such as instantiation of a specific um, standard cell from the library or using an, uh, an IP such as an SRAM block or something, that is the leaf cell. And we have to look for those leaf cells and bind our code to the uh, bind our net list to those leaf cells. Um, then we have what we call the target library, which is our standard cell library, which is what we want to map our RTL or our Boolean constructs to. Okay, basically they're just a, a, a set of all of the hard macros that we have. Um, that we have. Okay, so how do we do this? We can first of all take a path where we can search for our libraries. And uh, in Cadence Genus, with the common UI, we use this setDB command that sets all kinds of uh, attributes on our database. And one of the attributes is init lib search path, which is, says where we should look for our lib files, which are the files that uh, describe the uh, timing of our standard cells and our other hard macros for use by the synthesizer. So we just uh, put some path that's on our server where we should look for our lib files and this can be a list of many 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 different uh, paths to help us look for we don't actually need to put the path we can add our full description down below because when we actually read the libraries we use this read libs command and we give it a list of all the libraries that all the library files or the liberty files that we want to read um, in this case we're reading a file called tt1v25c now that's a very strange name that i chose to uh to to use for the example but it's very descriptive of a type of a liberty file each liberty file we'll see uh later is for a certain set of operating conditions and process corners. So in this case, uh, you would often find something like this that is a TT, that's a typical typical, that means that the PMOSs and NMOSs were fabricated in, a, a, in their typical corner. Then one volt, that would be like our main supply voltage, our VDD is one volt, and 25 degrees Celsius would be the temperature that that uh, library was characterized for. So we're gonna have to give a list of all the libraries at a certain process corner for uh, the tool to look for those leaf cells and uh, and to map the, uh, the RTL to, okay? Um, we'll also need to provide a, a Liberty file for all the IPs such as memory macros, IOs, and others. So those are all be in this type of a list over here. And after we um, run this command, our, uh, our synthesis tool will actually go and parse all of those library files. And the library files, they have a lot of stuff in them and uh, probably we'll get a whole bunch of warnings. Hopefully we won't get any errors, um, but we have to go over those and understand exactly what those warnings are and if there are any errors, look at it really well because it might tell us things that are, are wrong with our uh, library description and you know, garbage in, garbage out. If we give it something that is not correct, we're not gonna get good results. So we just said how we read in a library, but we don't know what a library is. So let's start discussing what a library is. A standard cell library is a collection of well-defined and appropriately characterized logic gates that can be used to implement a digital design. Okay, I really, really like the um, similarity to Legos. So when we take our Legos, we have these little dots over here, and the distance between the dots is well-defined both in the vertical and the horizontal direction. And if we take a Lego and we have to put our like uh, edges a certain distance from um, 
from these dots. And if we make a block that is not uh, that doesn't meet these standards, it's not going to connect with the other blocks, and it's just not going to work. So this is very similar to our standard cell library. We have to provide our logic gates, our inverters, and our AND gates, and so forth, and they have to adhere to a set of rules. And when they adhere to the set of rules, all the algorithms that we have uh, developed over the years and all of our tools will be able to use those standard cells and glue them all together. But if not, they're just not going to fit and not going to work. Okay, so um, in order to do this, what we do, uh, what a, an IP vendor does, they deliver a library, which is basically a set of files that describes these uh, cells that it provides in all kinds of ways, all the information that the different EDA tools need. Um, there is a lot of different information, a lot of different formats and so forth. We're going to discuss some of the important ones just to get uh, an idea of how it works. Um, you will have to actually go and see what each tool that you use needs and how uh, they're provided by your specific library uh, vendor. Okay, so I'm just going to give an example here of a standard cell and how it, 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 what we have to do to make it glue to the other standard cells similar to how the Legos glue to the other standard cells. So this is an AND and uh, we've seen the layout of an AND in, uh, in previous courses and what we can see here is that there is a, a specific height, a distance between this VDD and ground, that's called the cell height, and it has to be standard for all cells. There is a certain type of a width of the standard cells, and we'll see that the width has to be a multiple of a specific number. Okay, um, we have voltage rails. We have the VDD and the ground rails. They have to be a certain width, and they have to be in a certain placement, and um, they provide the power to uh, the cell. We have to have an end well inside the cell, to differentiate between the area of the PMOSs and the area of the NMOSs and also the different P-select and N-select type of uh, um, layers that will be inside here and let us pass our different design rules and make sure that the, the cell will be, um, will be fabricated correctly. And we have pin placement. So as you see here, I drew out this grid. We'll discuss them. They're called tracks and they're horizontal and vertical grids. And we want to put um, all of the pins right on the grid to... Um, to make sure that we can drop vias from a higher level that will connect directly to these different types of pins. Like as you see here, these will be pins in metal one and they, will, uh, they have to be exactly on the middle of where the metal one is. We have the PR boundary, that's the place and route boundary. So basically, for example, this cell, we say the boundary of the cell is uh, like this over here. And as you can see, it's actually, it doesn't cover the whole cell. And that's because the VDD and ground rails, they're shared with the cells that are in a different row. So if we have our uh, rows of VDD and then ground, and then another VDD maybe here, uh, and another ground down here, what we'll have is we'll have a cell over here and then um, and then the cell will be flipped so that we write an R to show what its direction is and we have the cell that's flipped over here and um, this will have they'll both have this same ground pin uh, that they share with each other so actually the, the eff effective cell size uh, ends in the middle of this block metal layers so we have to describe what little layers are inside the cells and ideally standard cells should be routed entirely in metal one and not go above it leaving us the rest of the area for uh, doing uh, more complex routing so what cells are in a standard cell library and we'll start with combinational logic cells nans nors inverters etc as we can see here obviously they're inside the library but that's not all each of these cells comes with a variety of drive strengths. So we have to put the output buffer that's inside the cell. There's some sort of an inverter or a buffer or some sort of uh, um, transistors inside the cell. And we provide different widths of these outputs to be able to drive higher and higher output capacitance. So we'll have lots of those. They're usually called like X1, X2, X3, and so forth to, to describe the size, the relative size of these cells. We have complex cells such as this AND or invert cell. You see there are these two AND gates and they get four inputs and then what this cell does, it actually combines these AND gates with this OR gate and uh, it inverts it. So that's an AND or invert or an AOI cell. We have different types of these like an OR AND invert and so forth. Um, we are able to efficiently make these as a single um, monolithic CMOS gate, and so they're provided by the library. They can carry out interesting functions. Um, cells that have a fan in up to four. Um, 
CMOS is really not a good uh, technology for having high fan in gates. It uh, puts serial resistance in at least one of the um, in one of the networks, either the pull up or the pull down, and therefore it's really bad at driving outputs if they have more than four inputs. So usually we have standard cells up to four inputs, uh, up to four uh, fan in of four. ECO cells we'll describe later. That's engineering change order cells. Those are bonus cells that we can use to fix all kinds of problems that we have during the design. Next uh, category is buffers and inverters. So we already did say inverter up here, but buffers and inverters are kind of special cells. Uh, we have lots of them. We use them for re as uh, repeaters to drive large loads and so forth. So we'll have many more uh, sizes of buffers and inverters than of other logic cells. Um, not only that, we have something that we call clock cells, which are cells with balanced rise and fall delays to minimize the skew um, once we build our clock tree, which we'll describe in, a, in one of the later lectures. Okay, we have delay cells. These are cells that um, just uh, as they uh, as they say they have a really bad propagation delay they delay uh, signals we use them often for instance for hold fixing and then we have level shifters which are another type of a buffer that allows us to communicate between um, multiple supply voltage areas or power domains as they're known as okay um, sequential cells so we have lots of different types of flip-flops positive and negative edge uh, triggered set reset uh, with Q and Q bar outputs, with enable, without enable, so forth. We have latches, we have integrated clock gating cells, and we have scan enabled cells for automatic test pattern generation. All of these things I'll describe in full in the coming slides. Finally, we have physical cells, such as fillers, tap cells, antennas, decaps, end caps, and tie cells. These are different cells that have a different functionality that we need, but they don't actually change the Boolean. They, they, they're not connected usually to any um, signals, and they don't change the Boolean functionality of the, uh, of the circuit. So let's start dr uh, diving down deep into those different types of cells, and we'll start with multiple drive strengths and VTs. So as I mentioned before, um, each type of standard cell is usually provided with several drive strengths. So as you can see here, there's a transistor with a width of uh, one and a half microns, and here's another transistor with a width of three microns. Um, and this one's much better at driving uh, an output than this one is, but it also has more leakage. And if uh, we have to do it with fingers or so forth, it will take up more area. And so we'll provide several types of these. This one we may call something like 1x or x1 or d1 or something like that. And this may be 2x or x2 or something. We're not usually knowledgeable. We don't have the knowledge of what the actual sizes are inside. Um, in most of the views, we don't really care. We mainly care about how their propagation delay is, um, is relative to the output load, and uh, we'll discuss that later. The other option of these types of cells is what we call multiple threshold cells, or MT CMOS. Um, what, uh, what happened was uh, over the years is that um, fabrication technology allowed us to actually just change the, uh, the VT, the threshold voltage of transistors, by adding or subtracting a certain type of a, a mask on, uh, and process step. And so what we do usually is we provide equivalent footprint cells. So let's say we have a, a type of an inverter, and this would be an inverter cell, and we don't know exactly what's going on inside, but there's some sort of a, a poly with a bunch of diffusions inside. And um, we can go and then take the same exact inverter, add a mask on that makes it a low VT mask, and then these transistors will be made with low VT, and that will make it have a, a better drive strength because the VT is lower. Um, on the other hand, it'll have more leakage. So if we see that we're not on a critical path, we can take this cell and just replace this single mask with a high VT mask. Okay, and the high VT mask will make these transistors much less leaky and give us lower power. It will cost the, in the propagation delay of the cell, but if it's not on a critical path, we may not care. So we uh, usually provide equivalent libraries with different VTs. Sometimes nowadays you'll have five, six, even seven different VT options for a, a single standard cell library. And again, since they're exactly the same size and have the same footprint, we can just uh, really mix and match between these um, at late stages of the design after we've already done place and, placement and routing. So the next type of cell that we'll elaborate upon is the clock cell. And 
In general, standard cells are optimized for speed. That does not mean that they're balanced. So we learned before that um, TPD or propagation delay is the average, or usually it's defined as the average of the low to high and the high to low transition of a cell. Um, when we minimize that and try to make the perfect cell, we get some sort of a beta ratio, a ratio between the pull up and the pull down in the CMOS cells, but it does not mean that we get a, 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 an equality here between the low to high and the high to low transition. So balanced cells are not necessarily the fastest cells, and usually what we have in a standard cell library in general is the fastest cell that we can make. Um, however, that's really bad for clock nets. When we have unbalanced rising and falling delays, we get un unwanted skew, which we'll learn about later. Okay, so that's why we have these special clock cells that are designed with balanced rising and falling uh, delays. That That's both in... Uh, in the TPLH, TPHL, and in the T-Rise and T-Fall at the outputs. So we try to make as balanced of cells as we can and provide them as what we call clock cells. You usually don't want to use these cells during your um, standard logic synthesis because, as I said, they're not optimized for speed. And in general, when we have so many cells in our standard cell library, it's best to, to, to not um, confuse the synthesizer in things that we don't actually want to use or want to take into account. Um, in general, also, we want to only use buffers and inverters on clock nets, uh, but sometimes we need all kinds of special gating logic. Sometimes we have like clock uh, multiplexers and once in a while all kinds of NANDs and ANDs and so forth, but we don't usually want to have any logic on our clock. Um, we'll discuss that later. Usually we want the clock to be very clean. Um, however, there are special cells like integrated clock uh, gate gates over here, and we'll learn about them more at the end of uh, lecture of part two of this lecture but they're provided uh, as clock cells in our library and they're also going to be optimized to be balanced the next category that we want to discuss is sequentials so sequentials of course are flip-flops and latches and um, generally we're going to use almost only flip-flops uh, we also do get a set of latches inside our standard cell library but there are lots of flip-flops and why are there lots of flip-flops well just take a look at this flip-flop here it has a reset pin it has an enable pin right it has a q output so we have to have all kinds of flavors of those so we can infer different latches from the the different rtl constructs that we're going to write so that means that we have positive and negative edge triggered uh, latches so that's kind of two categories we need synchronous and asynchronous reset but we can also have set so and we can have different combinations we can have both reset and set or and they can be both synchronous um, or uh, asynchronous so that's a lot of categories maybe six of those right then we can have the outputs be q and we can have q bar we can only have one of them or have both of them right we can have uh, these enables or we cannot provide the enables and then there's what we call scan which i'm not going to discuss right now but uh, when we discuss uh, design for test we'll discuss what a scan flip-flop is but you see we add a type of multiplexer to the the flip-flop and so we have to provide each and every one of these sets and combinations so you, you're talking about dozens of flip-flops uh, different drive strengths in the output buffers as well so Sequentials are a big part of our standard cell library. There's also going to be some encoding that tells us what the name of the flip-flop is, what it actually means. Okay, next I, I just am going to mention uh, briefly level shifters. They're a type of a buffer, right? Uh, level shifter is a cell that's placed between voltage domains to pass signals from one voltage to another. We can't usually just uh, send a signal at one voltage to a signal at, uh, to a uh, uh, to a signal that's powered by a different voltage. Actually, for the high to low shifter, as you can see in, in this little picture, it's just a, for a buffer, it's a set of two inverters, and they only need one voltage supply to do this. So it's actually just a regular old buffer. Um, one of the main reasons we need a special cell in the standard cell library is because it has to be characterized for the fact that its input is at one voltage and its output is at another voltage. Um, on the other hand, a low to high shifter is not that easy. Um, it actually needs to take a low voltage and uh, and uh, drive it up to the high voltage at the output and we usually use some sort of like cross couple DC VSL type of a of a structure here to make those and again we have to characterize them both for the input voltage and the output voltage um, these are very complex cells often they come in double height uh, so they take up two standard cell rows some uh, stuff about physical cells so filler and tap cells um, what happens is when we place our design what we do is we put a bunch of standard cells around we'll have one here and one here and one here but 
they won't be uh, exactly ad 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 adjacent to each other. There'll be these empty spaces in between. So all of these uh, type things, they're empty spaces that we leave uh, for routing and just for all kinds of reasons that we'll learn about during placement. Um, but if we have such a such a space, what we're gonna have to, uh, what we're gonna have is discontinuity in in different layers such as our wells. So we have one cell here with our rails. Right, and another cell here that's a bit far away with its rails. And uh, remember that there's this uh, N well that's inside of here. Well, if the N well is only here and here, then we have to actually tap this to VDD, and we have to tap this to VDD, and that would be a waste of area. So what we would do at the end is we'll take a filler cell which has nothing but things such as it's like a dummy cell that just has a continuity of the well and if we just tap one of those uh, this whole well will be tapped it's also used for density fillers uh, there are different reasons to have these fill cells and we have to put them in our whole um, our whole uh, core will be filled with these uh, taps with these filler cells after uh, when we finish our design okay um, in some uh, technologies mainly newer technologies we have what we call end caps these are different uh, special cells that we put at the ends of rows um, they are able to finish the row in a clean way um, newer technologies even have end caps that we have to put uh, top bottom different ones maybe for the corners so um, you get a set of these end caps and instructions in your standard cell library how to use them and where to put them in other fillers may include uh, MOS capacitors and um, that's for connecting VDD and ground so um, what I want to do actually is in any DC voltage I want to have a capacitor between uh, between any like uh, VDD and ground right this type of a capacitor will clean any type of noise uh, that will go out of here and all kinds of voltage droops and so forth so we want as much capacitance as possible between VDD and ground and one way to do that is just stick a capacitor right here in these filler cells um, and we can do that with different types of MOS caps. Um, we call the cells that uh, are fillers, we call them decap cells. Okay, uh, another type of uh, filler or a physical cell is what we call a well tap. So I mentioned here that we have to tap this to VDD, we have to put VDD in there and over here we have to put ground in, in, in the substrate. So um, in, in the past, in older technologies, we used to have these types of uh, taps inside our standard cells. Um, actually, we don't need to tap the well so often that it would be in each standard cell and takes up a lot of area. So instead, we have special cells such as this uh, filler cell, which has these well taps. All it does is it connects the uh, substrate to VSS and the N well to VDD and we have some sort of a design rule such as tw every 20 micron to scatter these around the design and you can see here that these are these uh, well taps that are pre-scattered around the design and we just make sure that inside every well we have one of them uh, all the time. Okay, um, there is an additional possibility with well tapping. We've discussed in the past uh, body biasing which can help us change the threshold voltage. Um, it's not very common to do in modern technologies except for in, uh, in fully depleted SOI, but if we want to do that, we take the same cell, we just do not make this connection between VDD and the cell, rather we take this well tap and connect it to whatever our uh, well voltage is. Um, uh, so that's another possibility, and so you may be provided with such, such uh, biasing cells as well. The next category I want to... Um, uh, to discuss is engineering change order cells. So uh, I don't think many engineers will remember uh, that ECO stands for engineering change order, but ECO is one of those three letter words that everybody discusses. And ECO is basically a very late change in the design. Usually we do it after place and route, um, and uh, sometimes we actually do it after fabrication for a respin of the chip in what's called a metal fix. Okay, um, there's a strange picture here on the right side. I was on a, a trip, a field trip, and we ran into this type of a strange fix that was uh, applied to this um, water pipe somewhere uh, in one of the national parks. And my friend uh, who works at one of the uh, VLSI companies here in Israel said, hey, when you see that, that's an ECO. Why don't you teach your students and show them the, uh, an example of an ECO? It's a real poor ECO, but obviously this was some sort of a late fix they did in the design. Okay, so um, we have to, an ECO is a very important part in uh, developing a chip. The reason being that um, uh, what happens is that uh, we, that it's very expensive to 
to not only re-spin a chip to make a whole tape out, but it's also very expensive just to run a whole place and route flow, which can take a long time. It can take days, in fact. And sometimes we don't have time and we find a late bug or want to make some sort of a hold fix or something like that, and we need to do a real small change. So how can we do this after placement? Or worse, how can we do this after tape out? So uh, w one solution that is done is what we call uh, spare or bonus cells. So we can scatter these green cells here. They're just a set of cells that we scatter around the design. Um, it's some sort of predetermined set. And we say these are bonus cells. They're just connected to ground or VDD. Their gates are, and, and their gates are connected to ground or VDD, so they don't actually do anything. Um, but what, what it means is that if we find some sort of a problem, we can go and uh, let's say this is some sort of a, an inverter here, and we find out that this flip-flop uh, let's say this is a flip-flop, it, it, it actually was it accidentally was getting an inverted signal and we need to invert it. So we'll take the metal piece that was connecting here, say to the clock, we'll disconnect it, we'll move it over to there and reconnect this here. So this uh, little piece of net will disappear and instead we'll use a new piece of metal. But this, uh, the, the, the transistors and so forth are already there. Now, first of all, um, after place and route, we can do just an incremental route and fix that area. Um, and that'll take a lot less time than running a whole uh, place and route flow over again. But actually after tape out, we can um, do that type of a fix and we don't have to re, uh, redo the masks that make all the transistors, which are the most expensive part of the process. We may be even able just in one or two metal layers to respin them without changing anything else. And then uh, it'll be much cheaper and we'll save money that way. So ECOs are something that are often done and uh, we use these bonus cells to, to do it. Um, the bonus cells are basically similar to any other standard cell, but we uh, have we give them a different name so it's easy to identify them in the net list and find them uh, in order to use them later. Okay, so um, we get to my favorite word, which is abstraction, um, which I use a lot. And uh, the question is, what is a cell? So a uh, detailed layout, right? When we take this layout that shows our poly and our, um, and our diffusions and whatever metals and contacts and stuff connect. Uh, I guess if we looked at the layout of a standard cell, we could figure out what it is. We could reverse engineer it, understand that it's an inverter or an AND gate, what its W and L are. We could even figure out, uh, we could run some spice simulations and figure out its, uh, its uh, delay and so forth. But do we really want to do that? I mean, that would take a long time, right? So instead, um, what we should do is we should go and figure out for the tool that we're running and the operation that we're doing exactly what kind of uh, information do we need. So for example, when we do logic simulation, we all we need to know is that inverter, it changes a zero into a one and a one into a zero. We don't really care if the inverter is made with a CMOS style or pseudo NMOS style or something else. Okay, um, we don't need to know what kind of transistors are inside a cell when we when we run synthesis. We just need to know the size of the cell and and the delay. So what we're going to do to make life and calculation simpler, we're going to abstract away this info, and each tool will only get the data it really needs. This will help us really improve um, runtime. It will even help us uh, keep keep our data a bit more confidential. So um, saying that, let's look at what we have in our standard cell library. Okay, so generally, this is a very high level overview. There may be a lot more stuff inside, but um, at least we'll have this type of stuff. So we have behavioral views. These are usually Verilog descriptions of, uh, of our standard cells, and they're used for civil, uh, simulation and logic equivalents. It's actually just a Verilog file that says what the cell is and has all kinds of things for doing uh, cool stuff like SDF back annotation, which we may discuss in the future. So as you see, this would be kind of a .v, a Verilog file. There is a type of file called Vital, which is what VHDL um, used to provide, but it's it's not used very much, very often, and actually not usually supplied by the by the by the library vendors. Um, physical views of the cells. So um, when we do need to run the tape out, we need to run a full DRC check and an LVS check and so forth. 
Um, what we'll need is the, the actual layout of the cell. This is provided usually as a GDS2 format. That's the format that talks about the layout. Um, however, uh, we don't need to know all that information. Um, for example, when we're running place and route, it's, it's, it's heavy. It, it takes up a lot of memory and so forth. So instead, we'll provide what we call a, a physical abstract or a layout abstract, um, which we usually use the library exchange format the left format so over here we have left cells and gds cells um, synopsis uses some different uh, uh, proprietary formats but we'll discuss left format in this course then we have the transistor level abstraction or the transistor level uh, files so when we want to run spice on um, on our on our net list and sometimes we want to do that and when we run around LVS and so forth what we'll need is the actual spice net list of our files with the transistors and so forth we'll often have it uh, a version that has just the transistors we may have a version that is after um, parasitic uh, extraction and so forth so uh, those will be like SPI sometimes CDL files and others then uh, maybe the most important file that we get inside our standard cell library is the timing and power files. These are the liberty files or the .lib files. Um, and Synopsys uses their own proprietary .db um, uh, uh, format. But these are files that have characterizations of timing and power for static timing analysis um, and for other things. Okay, then we'll have things like power grid views, which, uh, show, which uh, enable us to do IR drop and power analysis and other different types of things like we may have uh, symbols just to make nice drawings in our schematics of the symbols or we may get things like the OA libraries that's uh, Cadence's open access format which uh, lets us have easy integration with Virtuoso so these are uh, 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 this is uh, not all the files we may get inside a standard cell library but as you can see it's already a lot um, and these are things that are often provided just as a side note um, at universities and small companies and uh, we may not get what we call full backend views so for example GDS and uh, maybe spice or CDL files may not be provided um, they're not necessarily needed for a place in route run we can deal just with the left files the lib files the dot V files um, we can uh, that can be sufficient for just a purely digital backend run and this is a lot of times what is provided to universities so now we'll go and start discussing um, two of these types of files that we, we mentioned before. The first one is LEF or library exchange format. So what is LEF? A LEF is an abstract definition of the layout for place and route. It comes in a readable ASCII format. It contains detailed pin information for connecting, and it does not include front of the line, poly diffusion, et cetera, data. So here we see a layout view is type you might see in one of the, uh, the layout tools. And what we do is we take this and we use something called the abstract generator, and we just leave the pins and different types of obstructions that we may have inside the, the view. Okay. Um, so what an abstract is, it only contains these types of things, the outline, what so this is the layout view. We copy the outline, what the size is, the, the, the height and the width. We have the pin location. So here you can see the pin locations over here, A, B, and Y. And we have metal blockages. So these uh, types of metals, we can't put a type of uh, metal one through here, else it'll cause a short over when it touches this. Okay, so that's all we need to know actually for the place and route tool. And as you can see, we also want to have everything uh, only in metal one. That's not a must, but uh, it's good practice okay so um, here's a first look at what the syntax of the left format uh, looks like so again another example of a layout of some sort of an inverter and here we have the left of it um, what we're gonna have inside here is we're gonna have the header uh, this is called a, a macro is each cell name this cell is called IV for inverter and it has different uh, things here in the header that tell about it. For example, the physical cell size, uh, here it's 3 microns by 12 microns. Um, in addition, it has something called symmetry, which means we can flip it both to the X, we can turn it right and left, and we can uh, flip it to the Y, we can do up and down. We can't do the 90 degrees, so maybe when I said right and left, that could be uh, confusing, but we can use it both like this and flipped, so VDD is on the bottom and ground is on the top. 
Um, it has something called site core, which we'll discuss in a minute, and then it starts going into the descriptions of the different pins. So when we look at this pin here over, over here, A, it says pin A, it says it's an input pin. It has information for um, doing antenna rule detection, which we'll discuss in a later lecture. And then it has what we call a port, which is actually the physical description of where this appears. So it's all relative to the origin, which is at zero, zero down here. And it says that uh, metal one is a rectangle, that um, that there's a metal one rectangle um, from 0.5 microns and up 5 microns, that's this, to 1 micron and up 5.5 microns. That's the description of the pin, and we'll have that for each and every one of the pins here and each part of the pin layer. Then we can have something called OBS or obstruction that tells us where, for example, these uh, metal one pieces are that we can't route over. There is another uh, piece of the left uh, definition, which we call the tech left or the technology left. So uh, the technology left contains simplified information about the technology for use by the placer in the router. Um, that means that how do we know what the metal one layer was on the previous slide? Maybe it's called M1 and maybe it's called MET1 or something like that. So that has to be described before and that's in the part of the left called the technology left. Sometimes it's provided as a separate file and sometimes it's in the same file as your standard cell library, just depending on how the uh, technology provider and the IP provider uh, give us this information. So what does a tech left have in it? It has uh, things such as the layer definition. So you hear, see here layer met one, it's a type of routing layer. This is the pitch and the width and the spacing, what direction it should be, what its resistance per square is and what its capacitance per, uh, per square is. And um, then we uh, have all this type of stuff in it. So the name, the layer type, the electrical property, design rules and so forth. Okay, so that's one part of the left. Another part of the left is this site definition, which is the X and Y grid of the library. Okay, usually we'll use a core site. I'll go in a bit more to what the uh, left uh, site looks like in a second. And um, finally, we have other things such as vias. Vias are a special uh, type of layer in the left. There are lots of different, each type of via, via one, via two, and so forth that connect between the layers. They have different um, cut patterns, which we can have because they have to be um, covered by uh, the metal above them and the metal below them and they sometimes have to have specific sizes so this will be a big chunk of our technology left will be description of those vias and a good via definition is very important for place and route um, we'll have different things like the units if we're in microns or farads or whatever um, and then the grids for layout and routing such as the tracks and so forth just an additional point here that uh, sometimes that we also have to have parasitic extraction rules they can be very basic what's known as cap tables that's not uh, sufficient for today's technologies or more detailed like a binary file such as cadences Qantas or QRC tech file they have to be provided to help us do parasitic extraction it's part of the technology left so um, just things that are important about the technology left when we talk about uh, standard cells we usually define a standard cell uh, according to how many tracks the standard cell has when we say that all the standard cells have the same height because the uh, distance between VDD and ground is uh, the same for all the cells in a certain library. Well, when we try to say something about the library, we say it's like a 12 track library, an eight track library, um, and that means how many tracks of metal one we can stick in between VDD and ground, and uh, one track is basically a pitch of metal one. So that's uh, the width of metal one plus the spacing of metal one. Um, why do we use the track number or the number of tracks as a, a describer for a standard cell library? And that's because the wider the uh, the, the the higher the standard the, the standard cell is, or the larger the distance between VDD and ground is, or uh, equivalently, the the high the more number of tracks we can put in between VDD and ground, it means that we can get wider transistors. So, for example, in this uh, in this type of a cell, we can have a piece of poly like that and put some diffusions around it and uh, we can put a diffusion that's that big or we can also put a diffusion let's say that would be that big but we cannot put a diffusion that would be that big if we wanted a wider diffusion what we'd have to do is actually make another finger and then have uh, uh, connect several transistors to make this uh, larger transistor therefore uh, when we have a 
high number like an 11 or 12 track library that means we can put really wide transistors on one uh, string of poly here and that means we can get fast cells or high drive strength cells on the other hand if we only need a small transistor then we're wasting a lot of area because the, the whole height of the standard cell library is, uh, is larger. So it really provides us a trade-off between fast cells, which would be these 11 or 12 track libraries, or, uh, versus like high area efficiency cells, which would be like a seven to eight track library, or somewhere in the middle, which would be kind of like a nine or 10 track library. Okay, so I mentioned before this thing called a site, and a site has to appear for every standard cell library. It's actually the definition of the uh, smallest unit in a standard cell. It's kind of similar to defining in our Lego pieces, you know, what the uh, distance between these little uh, dots is in uh, the horizontal and vertical direction, so they'll all connect. And what we have to define in a, in a site is, at the very minimum, what our um, smallest size is uh, for height and for width. Okay, so uh, that means that basically it's the minimum size cell that you could possibly have, um, and the height, which would be uh, written here, is always going to be um, much, uh, it's going to be uh, equivalent for all of the cells in our library, except for maybe um, double row, uh, double row cells, but uh, they're, uh, they're an outlier. And uh, the x axis, the horizontal pitch is it's we, we're not going to be able to make a cell that's that small but um, every cell has to be multiple of that in the x direction okay so that's what a, uh, a, a site, that's what our, what our site is and we just called the site here core we could have called it whatever we want and it has a class core that means it's used for standard cells versus class pad which is used for ios and it has symmetry which tells us which ways we can flip those types of uh, cells by default unless it's overrid inside the um, actual cell definition. Um, another thing is that the pins, we want to have the pins coincide with the routing track and that enables easy connection of higher level layers uh, by just dropping a via. So if we have our uh, standard cell over here, we, we, we're going to have a bunch of things defined inside the left. It's kind of to summarize, this X here marks what we would call the cell origin. It's usually going to be at zero, zero of the cell. Okay, we're going to have the PR boundary. That's going to be the width and that's going to be the height in the cell size. We're going to have the horizontal grid, which is where the metal one tracks go on a horizontal level. We're going to have the um, vertical grid where the metal two tracks go on a vertical level. And of course, uh, higher, uh, higher level tracks as well. And we want to have our pins fall on the middle of these vertical tracks. So then we can just dump a via down there and it'll connect nicely. So we've gotten to the part of our lecture where we look into the chip hall of fame and this week we have this nice little chip over here on the right and um, that is the Acorn Computer's ARM1 processor which we're just going to look at after we had two Intel chips in our first two lectures. So Acorn Computers I'm sure not a lot of you have heard of. Uh, you've probably heard of uh, ARM and um, the reason that you've heard of ARM is because your smartphone or almost any uh, machine you have that has a compute, uh, some sort of computation unit inside it that is not uh, a laptop or a desktop or a server is going to be using one of the grandchildren of this guy over here. Um, ARM, in interestingly, stands for Acorn Risk Machine. So Acorn Computers made this uh, computer architecture. Um, it was a risk architecture, a reduced instruction set. Uh, computer and so they called it an acorn risk machine and um, the uh, um, the acronym for that is arm and now everybody knows arm because it is the leading architecture for embedded computers this chip was released in 1985 in uh, 3 micron CMOS technology with 25,000 transistors um, and the interesting thing here is that the whole reference code for this architecture was written in, written in 808 lines of basic. Um, it was never sold as a commercial part, a product, interestingly. It was just a co-processor for the BBC Micro. And uh, later on, they came out with the further versions of the architecture, ARM v2, ARM v3, which uh, little by little became more and more popular and somehow found their way into every machine we have at home, pretty much. So now we'll discuss the Liberty timing models, which as I mentioned before, are probably the heart of our standard cell library and the most important file that we have during synthesis.
So an introduction to liberty. So how do we know to delay through a gate in a logic path? Running SPICE is way too complex. If we would take each transistor and try to solve the uh, compact model equations that we get from SPICE, it would take a really, really long time. Instead, what we'll do is we'll create a more simplistic timing model that will very, very much simplify the calculation without um, getting too bad an estimation of what the timing is. So our goal is that we take every timing arc, and arc is uh, any path between an input and output. That's one arc, that's another arc. So for every timing arc, we will calculate two things. We will calculate the propagation delay. And again, a timing arc is not only the direction here, but it's also if we had a rising transition here when there was a, say, a one over here, what we're gonna have is a rising transition on the output of this uh, uh, and and if we had a falling transition we'll have a falling transition on the output of this and so each of those are separate timing arcs and we have to um, calculate the uh, propagation delay of each of them but not only that we also want to calculate what the um, uh, the rise or the fall time of the output transition is so that's our goal with uh, our timing model and what do we base this on well our model is based on two simple um, factors one is the rise or fall time the transition at the input to the gate and the other one is the load at the output of the gate so given the transition at the input of the gate and the load at the output of the gate we're going to calculate the tpd and the t rise or t fall at the output so um, just a, a quick uh, important point here that I also did mention before, but it's really important. Um, but the, the actual TPD and T rise and T fall that we'll get are very dependent on the operating conditions. So it depends on if the transistors in here are fast or slow. It depends on the voltage that we connect here. We could put a higher supply voltage or a lower supply voltage. And it depends on things like the temperature. It would even depend on the extraction corner that we get the metals that we connect over here. So um, what we're going to do is actually run a characterization for uh, each of these standard cells at certain operating conditions and each library we'll get will be characterized for a certain operating condition and will usually be provided with several of these sets of operating conditions inside our standard cell library and we have to decide which ones to to run in order to to meet our timing requirements and we'll uh, we'll discuss that in a later lecture so general about the liberty format so we can see here kind of an overview of the liberty format um, from a hierarchical level and let's just dive into what we have inside so at the beginning we have this uh, keyword library and the name of the library which almost always will have some sort of a description of our corner such as the tt one volt uh, 25 degrees celsius that we had before because we need to know what uh, corner it is when we're calling the file it will also say that inside the header um, the header data that we have inside here the header data will have all kinds of things like general information that's common to all the cells in the library wire loads lookup tables and things that we'll discuss in a moment Okay, then we go into the next level of hierarchy, which is a cell definition. For, so for every cell we have in our library, every standard cell, every size of standard cell, every VT option of standard cell, every type of sequential, each and every one of those standard cells will have this cell definition that will say the name and then have different attributes that we have for every one, so, such as their area, their function, and so forth. Okay, and then inside each cell, we'll go into the important part, which is the pin uh, selection and the pin will describe for every pin um, information such as the capacitance the timing leakage power and so forth um, note already I'll say it here but we'll see in a minute that all the timing and so forth are related to the output pins only okay so diving deeper into that um, what is the the actual timing model so we said that what it has to get is the input transition the output capacitance and return to us the um, tpd and the t rise t fall so what we use uh, traditionally is called the nonlinear delay model or nldm and as you can see here what we're supposed to get is this kind of a table the table has in one uh, axis it has the output loads in picofarads and in on the other axis we have input transitions and we provide a list of these output Output loads and input transitions and for each one of them we run a spy simulation and we write down what our TPD or T rise T fall or a power or so forth that we get at uh, through that spy simulation and we fill in this table that's described inside our lib file in uh, in a pair of ways first we have to describe what 
the accesses of our table are. So that's with this LU table template, and we call this table template delay template five, uh, five by five, and we see that variable one, this one, or this one, I guess, is the input net transition. Variable two is the total output net capacitance, and then we say what the, the uh, values are. So that would be these values that are along the line. Okay, so now once we have a delay template, we can use it inside every timing uh, um, description and in, inside every table that we use in, in different pins. So we have this cell called inverter X1. One of inside that we have the output pin is called Y, and inside there there's uh, uh, one of the things is called timing, and inside timing there's cell rise delay. So that's the TPD LH, so the rising um, propagation delay. We use this delay template that we had over in the header, and then these are all the values that are inside the table over here. Okay, now what do we do with all that? Um, we, we're taking a driver model, which is a ramp voltage source. So we assume that our voltage source is, it's a perfect voltage source that goes like this with a fixed drive resistance. And second of all, we have a receiver model where we say that this uh, receiver, it's just a perfect capacitor that doesn't change um, during our transition. And then we want to make a function that the TPD and the T-Rise T-Fall are a function of the input transition and the output load. How do we do it? Well, we just interpolate the numbers here. We now know that our, uh, our output load is, say, 0 0.075 picofarad, and our input transition is uh, also 0 0.075 picofarad. We go into the table. We don't find that exact number, so we take the values around it and interpolate and find what uh, a good nonlinear delay um, guess would be about that. So that is very, very fast. We just use these lookup tables and do a, a real simple arithmetic um, uh, calculation. Um, it doesn't at all matter cap variation during transition, and that's really bad because lower than about 130 nanometers, it loses accuracy. Um, so just an uh, example of how this type of a thing works. So let's see. We have uh, an input transition of 0.1 nanoseconds, and uh, we have a capacitor on the output, and we have a different type of a transition that we see somewhere else is a, 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 um, a high to low transition at the input um, uh, of 0.12 nanoseconds. So when we want to see, for example, uh, the rise will cause TPD HL will cause a cell fall. So we want to see what the TPD is. We go to this table called cell fall, right? And we see 0.1 nanoseconds. Hmm, where does that fall? It falls somewhere in between this and this, right? And the output load is one is uh, one picofarad. It's somewhere in between here. So it's in between these four squares, and we interpolate and we find out that the actual number should be 0.178 nanoseconds. So we found that the propagation delay was the uh, was 0.178 nanoseconds. We also want to see the T fall. So there we go to the table called fall transition. It again will fall in this uh, foursome of, uh, of numbers, and we see that it's 0.147 nanoseconds. If we wanted to see the TPD for the rising, where this went down and this will go up, We'll go to this table and find out what it is. So that's kind of how the linear delay, nonlinear delay models work. But we said it's not very accurate. So what uh, happened is several years ago, both uh, Cadence and Synopsys came up with their own formats. Uh, the Synopsys format is called CCS or concurrent current source, and the um, the Cadence model is called ECSM. Um, and uh, and these model at the nonlinear output behavior uh, as a current source. So we again have a model for a driver. Um, so the, the driver here is a nonlinear current source, and we have the model for a receiver, and the receiver is a changing capacitance. And this gives us a, a lot better um, estimation. In fact, at least in, in a bit older technologies, it was in, within 2% of uh, spice. You need some more values. You need a bit more calculation, but it is essential to use today. So you're supposed to only use these types of models with anything below something like a 100 nanometer process. Okay, uh, just to, to, to point that out, what the difference is between these nonlinear delay models and the concurrent current source, the, the details don't really matter that much. But if in our nonlinear delay model, our receiver model was just this uh, in, input capacitance, uh, or uh, uh, that was all our receiver was, what we had on our output load was just this single value of, uh, of a capacitor. Um, when we go over to one of these uh, current source models, our uh, 
uh, our capacitor uh, capacitance changes along the way and so therefore for every input slew and output cap we have a different value for this area of our c1 and our area of c2 and these are taken into account when calculating the delay uh, second when we take our um, our driver model um, what we had before for uh, for uh, what we had before is we just had a, a standard input slews and they would give us our numbers here we have a uh, changing current source for each uh, uh, pair of input slew and output cap so it's a much more complex model and it's much more accurate um, good question is okay we can take a, some sort of a gate that we have along the way and we see that it's uh, driving all kinds of other gates over here and we can say, aha, each one of these has an input capacitance that we know, and we can know then, and we know the uh, intrinsic output capacitance here, so we know what the C load is, right? But what about the wire, right? Are we gonna just uh, neglect the wire? Well, that wouldn't be too smart. So, because the wire is often now dominant, but what do we do at the synthesis level when we don't know anything uh, about the, the actual uh, parasitics that we have? So how do you estimate the parasitics of a net before placement and routing? And the answer is what we do is we use something called a wire load model, or at least we used to use something called a wire load model, and it actually was a very bad estimation, but that is what was done. This is how a wire load model is described in a, in a Liberty file. And you may have several of them and you can choose which wire load model you want to use. Um, but I'll tell you the truth, it doesn't really matter because it's really poor estimation. How did they guess what the wire load here was? Well, they counted what the fan out was. In this case, the fan out is two. So they would go to one of these tables. They look, mm, fan out is two. Then that means the resistance of this wire is 0.01295 and the capacitance is 0.00812 just according to the resistance. Just let me give you an example of why that's very inaccurate. Well, let's say I have a chip and inside the chip, I have an inverter and the inverter has lots of these other guys. Maybe it's driving four other uh, inverters that are right by and I go into this table and I see that the uh, resistance is 0.02 and the capacitance is 0.018, right? But then again, I have another inverter over here and this inverter is driving another inverter on the other side of the chip over here. But what is its fan out? Its fan out is one. So we see that it, the, the estimation is that the uh, resistance and capacitance of this, this net is, um, well, it's about five times the size as this resistance, and it's about six times the size of that capacitance, even though obviously this net would be much worse in terms of capacitance and resistance. So this uh, guessing through fan out what the resistance and capacitance are is not a very good um, is not a very good way to do it. That's why uh, nowadays we should use physical aware synthesis, which um, actually goes and does some sort of a placement and merges placement into our uh, synthesis flow. So what we do is in synopsis, it's called topographical mode in cadence. It's called physical synthesis, and um, there are uh, several uh, options of how to run this. Uh, uh, you have to look into the documentation of each tool to see. But for example, if we run uh, sin opt minus physical, it will run physical aware synthesis in cadence genus. And what it does, it takes the left files and does some sort of a placement inside. And if you're already on a later iteration after you've done at least one iteration of place and route, you can import a floor plan as a, a .def file, a def file. And uh, that will tell uh, the, the, the tool what the floor plan is. It will actually run a whole placement run and then it will get much better um, parasitic extraction to, to, to base its wire load models upon. So to summarize part one of the synthesis lecture, we'll just discuss some other contents of the standard cell library very briefly. So we can have all kinds of other files and formats uh, in addition to, to the left and lib as we discussed before. For example, we'll have the GDS files that describe the um, detailed layout. We'll have the Verilog files that will help us run logic simulation. We'll have ATPG or automatic test pattern generation files to run all kinds of design for test type of stuff. Power grid models to help us see if our power grid is working correctly. OA databases to help us uh, connect to Virtuoso or other front end type of design tools. Spice models models which help us run spice simulations etc 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 there may be many more by the time you see this video um, but the one important thing that you have to know uh, is how do you actually navigate through these uh, these libraries which 
are kind of given in different types of formats and they each have different contents. Well, we want to go and look at the documentation and the data sheets, which will be provided hopefully with every library you will meet. So um, are we just supposed to look through and see what the vendor decided to provide us with? And the answer is unfortunately, yes, there is no real standard on how a library is provided. You just have to search through, look through and study it a while and um, ask your support to help you uh, give you some additional details. But the PDFs inside will usually describe a lot of the things in the library and there will also be data sheets that will uh, tell you about each corner. For instance, if, if we want to know what the different standard cells are, are that are supplied, because they may not be very trivial names, sometimes they can have strings of dozens of letters inside and we want to know what they are, we go into the data sheet and it will show us uh, what's going on. For example, we can see uh, in this data sheet we have a NAND gate and um, we have over here the symbol of the NAND gate. Um, we can see what uh, what it looks like and um, we have the truth table of the NAND gate over here which shows what its functionality is and then we'll have some electrical parameters which will show the different sizes and types of NAND gates provided by this library and different things like the uh, propagation delay that's expected maybe some sort of function that will kind of show what's in the lib file maybe leakage and dynamic power and the sizes of the gate so all kinds of things like that you can expect to find in your library. And the last point, what about other IPs? So I mentioned it before, we have different IPs such as SRAMs or analog IPs or IO cells or different things that aren't an actual standard cell per se. They're not just a logic gate. They may have uh, much more complex functionality, but they're provided as a type of a hard macro. So when we get an IP, we also get the same exact type of a library as we would get with a standard cell, uh, and it should include most of these views that a standard cell library will have. They're uh, required for integrating the hard macros in the standard design flow. For, in for instance, we'll have to have some sort of behavior behavioral Verilog file that will say uh, what's, what, how the, uh, this different IP is going to um, act and uh, we'll have to have lib files and so forth. Okay, memories are a special case and uh, um, we will usually be provided with what's called a memory compiler where we can choose the sizes of the memory and different types of things and when we push the button we'll get a whole set, it will actually generate a library for us that will have all the libs and lefts and GDSs and everything that we need. So that's it for this lecture and next week we'll discuss um, the actual uh, synthesis flow which is uh, all of these things, the rest of these points here.